each other are going to have a big battle, what do they do? They study about how the other guy fights. They study the other people's maneuvers and moves, and they watch them and watch them and watch them and watch them. So they don't know what to do. Now, <clears throat> Christianity, except for Catholicism, has never been a threat to the world. Catholicism was a horrible uh, example of Christian dumb. It was not Christianity. It was not Christian crusades. They did that. Islam learned a lot of bad things from them, and uh, they had a good start with Muhammad. Now, I'm going to read to you, and every one of our missionaries in any Islamic country have to abide by these rules today. Today. All right, I'm talking about not 300 years ago. I'm not talking about 1,000 years ago. We're talking about today, okay? <clears throat> the Pact of Umar is basically still, you know what I'm talking about. The Pact of Umar is still in effect. You know what I'm talking about? No. Okay, now you've lived extensively in Islamic countries, haven't you? When I was little. So when you were little. One time they robbed your house, and what did they tell you? Um, the, it, it's all right. It's not a sin for a Muslim to steal from a Christian because they're infidels. They're infidels. So, in other words, they can come and rob you, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's yeah. no, I mean, it, it, that, there's no protection. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the idea of Islam is to bring into subjection all other societies. Either they convert to Islam, and they swear up and down there's no for forced conversion which is ridiculous. You either submit to Islam and become a, you know, a, a Muslim, or you are under tremendous pressure. Now, if you live in one of these countries, and our people, our missionaries, just some of our missionaries just went over this last fall into an Islamic country. They could not pray publicly. You cannot wear a cross. You can't do anything that makes you look like a Christian. And the reason for that is I'm going to read that to you here. All right. Now, this was uh, between 634 and 644 A.D. Okay. The Pact of Omar ensured the Christians continued humiliation and degradation and disgrace. This is what it ensures. In return for safety for ourselves, our children, property, and followers of our religion, the Christians agreed to this pact not to build a monastery or a church or sanctuary for a preacher or a monk. They can't do this in these countries. You can't restore any older place of worship that needs restoration. You cannot do that. You can not use such places for the purpose of enmity against Muslims. <clears throat> you cannot allow a spy against Muslims enter your churches, homes, or hide in deceit or betrayal against Muslims. You must not imitate Muslims in clothing, caps, turbans, sandals, hairstyles, speech, nicknames, or title names. Our presidents, two of our presidents just broke this rule. The first one was George Bush. The second one was Obama. We had two of them that broke these rules. Okay? <clears throat> you shall not imitate Muslims in clothing, caps, turbans, sandals, hair, hairstyle, speech. You not, shall not imitate their speech or quote their prophets out of context. And we just had both. George Bush did that, and so did Obama, both of them. Nicknames or title names. You shall not ride on saddles. You, not, you shall not arm yourselves with swords on the shoulders, collect weapons of any kind, or carry these weapons. You not, shall not encrypt on our stamps in Arabic. You shall not sell liquor. Number nine, teach our children the Quran. Publicize practices of shirk. You know what the practice of shirk is? You know what a shirk is? You know what a shirk is, young lady? 
Is it the knife that they hide? Oh, no. Oh. Uh -huh. Sure. That's a terrible sin. And the most terrible sin that you can commit, the most terrible sin that you can commit, that's it. The most terrible sin that you could commit, I said that's it to her because she got the right book, <laughs> oh. is to reject Islam. Is to reject Islam. That is associating partners with Allah, such as regarding Jesus as the Son of God, in other words, Christian or other non Muslim religions practice, shall be private. And you shall not propagate Christianity in any Islamic country. You shall not, what, this is number 10. Yeah, but is there a section or something? It's number 10. This is the, uh, the Pact of Umar. The Pact of Umar. This is still in effect today. <clears throat> it's what we call Sharia law. Okay? You shall not build crosses on the outside of our churches or demonstrations. Uh, uh, demonstrating them in our books in public, in Muslim fairways, markets. Again, Christian worship must be not public where Muslims can see or hear it or be annoyed by it. You shall not sound bells in your churches except discreetly to raise the voices while reciting holy books inside our churches in the presence of Muslims, nor raise our voices with prayer in our funerals light torches in funeral processions or on the fairways or in Muslim markets. Number 13, you cannot bury your dead next to a Muslim dead. You cannot buy servants who are, were captured by Muslims. You shall not invite any shirk that is a proselytize. You shall not invite anyone to proselytize or you shall not invite any Muslim to Christianity at all that's that's this is present tense now this will happen in 600 AD but it's still in force today you shall not prevent any of our fellows from embracing Islam you shall not try to talk them out of that if they choose to do so thus the Christians can be objects of proselyting but must not engage it in themselves you shall not beat or strike a Muslim you shall allow Muslims to rest in your churches whether they come day or night. You shall open the doors of your houses of worship and your homes for the wayfarer and the passerby if he's a Muslim. You shall provide board and food for those that are Muslims who come as guests for at least three days. You shall respect Muslims and move from the places where you set if one of them comes into a room where you are, you must give them your seat. You shall have the front of our hair cut and wear customary clothes wherever they are and wear belts around their waist. These are that a Muslim recognizes a non-Muslim. You must dress like a Christian so they'll know who you are. You have to wear your way. Remember the yellow stars and in Germany you shall not greet George Bush did this and so did Obama you shall not greet peace be upon you that's how they do that that's how when they speak name uh, 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 Muhammad's name or one of the prophets they say peace be upon you and they greet each other that way you shall not do that which is a Muslim greeting for fellow Muslims only you shall not be guides for Muslims and refrain from preaching their privacy in their homes if we break any of these promises that we set forth your benefit against ourselves then our promise of protection is broken and you are allowed to do with us as you please in defiance of your religion that's present tense <clears throat> today we're at war <clears throat> That's a pact. The pact of Umar, U M A R. 
It's still in effect in all Muslim countries today, and this goes back to the sixth century. And you know that, young lady. You've been there, so have I. So has she. <clears throat> this is the way it is today. Everything that Susan B. Anthony did and uh, Elizabeth Stanton for the American women. You know, the women in America did not have the right to vote until 1920. Did you know that? They had no right to hold any property nor inheriting property or anything else. Everything that they did for, I think, nearly 70 years apiece, over 60 years, both of them fought hard for women's rights in America. Everything they did has just been erased. Erased. America was the only place in the world where women had any rights at all. And it's basically because of those women and how hard they fought for it. Some of the things they did, I don't agree with, but uh, they fought hard for women to have equal rights and uh, to inherit property from their husbands. They could not do any of this. None of this was allowed. And it didn't begin until the middle of the last century. Push it. What? If you was a woman and you own property because your husband passed away, you could vote prior to the right in the U.S. Constitution. There's a lot of things that changed. If you were an American Indian, women always had the right for education and voting. The civilized tribes, the Chickasaws, the Cherokees, the Choctaws, all of those, they had colleges in the 15 and 1600s, and women could go to those countries colleges and women always had a right to vote in all the tribal they were pure democracies that took a long time to rub off on the anglo-saxon world i'm going to tell you it took a long time because it wasn't any place else it took a long time and it was here that's the only thing it, it later on that let's The greatest, you know what the greatest obstacle to giving the women, the women the right to vote was? Does anyone know that in America? You know what it was? Do you know, Christine? Marilyn, do you know what it was? The greatest obstacle, why men didn't want women to have the right to vote? Prohibition. Prohibition. They thought they would outlaw liquor, which they did. <laughs> it got reversed. If, if we under Sharia law in America, which we're already under today, it's just getting stronger all the time, you will, it will, it will have prohibition again It's in all those other countries. They do a lot of wild things, you know, but prohibition, you know, liquor is bad. All right. 2 and verse 12 now, 2 and verse 12. Adam's Jewelry Store. Adam's Jewelry Store. We're looking at this. This is beautiful. You gahav. Haaretz. Now you can write down above these. Now you can write down this. You gahav, haaretz, hahiv, tov, sham, ha bidolach, we avim, ha shaham. Let's look at this. You gahav. That is and gold. Gold. The place has got this this place here that we're talking about right now. It's just beautiful. Uh, Sharon, do you want to come up here and read about uh, about the last five verses in the Amplified Bible and get us to where we are? So some of you haven't been here during some of this. Okay. Okay. Eight. Two and verse about uh, eight okay. through twelve. Okay. Two eight through twelve. Okay. And the Lord planted a garden towards the east of Eden, meaning delight. And he put the man whom he had formed, framed, or constituted. And on the ground the Lord made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight or to be desired, good, suitable, pleasant for food. The tree of life also in the center of the garden and the tree of knowledge of the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided to become four river heads. The first is named Pishon. It is one flowing around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is of high quality. Bedellium and onyx and stone are there. 
you want me to go on? Okay, which one are you now? On 12? Yeah. Okay, that's okay. right there. All right. So we have a garden. What does the word to God or garden mean? What does it mean? You remember what God? Garden. Huh? Wall, garden. It means a guarded pleasure park. It means a, 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 and it means what? Eden. Eden means what? Garden, we have a guarded pleasure park. How about the, the name Eden? Eden. You remember what Eden meant? Uh, what? Food, what? Special food. Like. It meant dainties. Dainty. It meant yeah. just real dainties. I preached a, a message at Town and Country Baptist Church this morning, one second after you die, and we went into Luke the 16th chapter. And that king there, old, old Nineveh or Dives, he fed on dainties every day. Small, cut up morsels of food. Now, when you go into a fancy restaurant in different places, what do they give you? Little bitty portions that isn't enough to fill you up. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't like five star restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> Little bitty portions of dainty things, which are called hors d'oeuvres to begin with. These are your hors d'oeuvres. And you have different kinds of hors d'oeuvres. These are dainties, real special, uh, wonderfully, wonderful tasting foods. All right? just to get your appetite moving on, as if they had to, <laughs> when you go into a place like that. Uh, those are, that's what we call Eden. That's, that, that means living delicately, living a spoiled life. Uh, we talked about last week that they had their grapes peeled for them and the seeds taken out of them and they were served to them like that, all of the dainties of life. That's what the name Eden meant. It, it was a a pleasure palace is what Eden was. A pleasure palace. All right. And gold, the land, the ha'ar, it's the land. The that, ha'hu. Uh, good, very good. All right, good. They, the, the equivalent there in, um, in the Greek Septuagint is kalos. But in some ways like this, this wasn't just kalos, but what it should have, what should have been the word in Greek. Remember what that word should have been? Hmm? Agathos. 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 Let's write it on the board here. We're studying both languages. Agathos. Okay, this word agathos there, that means spiritually good. What's this place spiritually good? Who built it? Anything that God made, could it be uh, defunct? Could it be? No. God, God creates perfect things only. Only that which is perfect. Tov, spiritually good. The better translation in the Septuagint would be Agathos. There, Sham. Sham means what? The name Shem comes from it, doesn't it? What does it mean, brother? It means there. There, but something more than there. What is there? Is at Jerusalem. Huh? Yeah, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. But what is there? Very good there. Over there, yes. The people of God? M more than that. It's a monument or a place of renown. Okay? It means something famous or a place of renown also. It means over there, but it means more than over there. We get our idea of there in English, but that's not the whole story in Hebrew. It means... A monument. The name Sham comes from the same one, which means name or monument or pillar, okay, or renowned. And there, Bedellium. Bedellium. It means odorous, transparent gum that gold and color filled like manna. Like manna. What can you have? What can you uh, equate to this today? What did you just eat? Oh, a donut? Yeah. What, did it, what made it so flavorful? Oh, sugar. 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 All right. Sugar. Sweet like sugar, like honey. Okay. It is. Now, manna tasted like what? What did manna taste like? Honey. Whatever they Come on. Just explain it. What did manna taste like? Whatever it wanted, they wanted it to be. What did manna? Manna means what, by the way? What does manna mean? Ma. Ma means, ma means what? 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 <laughs> yeah, what is it? That's what manna means. What is it? Now, what did manna taste like? How many of you have been to IHOP? 
International House of Pancakes. It tasted like pancakes with honey on it. That's what it tastes like, pancakes with honey. Yeah. Pancakes with honey on it. That's what, it, that's what manna tastes like, pancakes with honey. Bellum and stone, we avim, and stone the onyx. All right, stone the onyx. There was a good smell and good taste and stuff there. And this stone with onyx. Now this onyx stone is different. What color is onyx today? Black. Black. What color is this? This is old. This is a flesh colored. This is carnelian, all right? And I forgot to bring my book again tonight. I was so going just like that today. Preach here 25 miles, preach over there, and then come go home and get them out on the website and then run back here and, and got here one minute late. <laughs> I just couldn't do any better. The archaeological Bible on page 6 is something that I wanted to read. The rivers are Eden, and Eden means what? Delight. Precious foods. Okay? Think about that. How would you like to be in Eden today? That would be a good name for a Yeah, Eden. Eden. Phasis, Arxas, the uh, Bisinga, the Indus, the Ganges, the Hyphasis, the Nile, and the Gasha. These are all different ancient rivers in archaeology, okay? 213, I'll have to bring that book next week. We'll have to quit before too long. All right. Isn't this a beautiful environment that God put Adam in? Then Adam fell from it, and God has always had a messenger in the world, hasn't he? He always has had something to bring, bring us back to God and, and, and religion. Religion either binds you back to God, that's what religion means, the act of binding back again, or else it damns your souls. It was one or the other. And we live in a, a world of spiritual warfare. The Lord called out his church and said it wouldn't fail, which it hasn't when he called it out from in Galilee. But the devil called out hundreds, hadn't he? And we're in a spiritual warfare, just constant spiritual warfare. We Shem. Hanahar. Hashani. Are you writing this stuff down now? Get your little pencils out. Gichon. Hugh. Hasovan. Et. Call. Eretz, Cush. All right, now let's go back over this again. Now the first word is we Shem. Look at that we on the front of that. What is that there, uh, Christine? What's that we? You know what that we is? We, we Shem, we. That's a conjunction is and, and that's on page 253. If you want to write that down in your little book, we Shem. All right, we and then Shem. And name. See what I told you about that word Shalm and Sham, Brother Roger? Here it means name or monument. Name or monument. And name Ha Ha Nahar. Look at that. You see that uh, name there? It's got a, a doggish in the middle of it, doesn't it? What's that doggish do? It doubles it, doesn't it? Doubles it. All right. Han Nahar. The river. And the river. The split, the division. That's what the word shini means, isn't it, Roger? Shini means to divide. It means two, but it means to divide. And the second, or the split, or the divide, or it also means repeat. Gihon. Gihon means bursting forth. Bursting forth. And this, him, now it is ha so ven. Ha so ven. Ha so ven. That psalmic there has got a doggish in the middle of it, which does what? Doubles the sound, the S sound. There's lots of S's in Hebrew. Ha so ven. That means uh, like Galilee. What's Galilee mean? Circle. circle. All right, so this means circle. Encircling, surrounding. It's masculine and singular, cow participle. It is encircling or surrounding. 
bursting forth, all right? Bursting forth. Et. Et is a sign of direct object. What is the what is the sign of direct object in Greek? And tell me the grammatical rule for it. Ace. All right, what's the grammatical rule? Extension, say it with me, extension or limitation of thought of verbal action. Extension or limitation of thought of verbal action. It shows you the idea of this action, okay? I don't want anybody else can tell you that. I don't even hear any other teachers doing that today. I remember Brother Ken went back to the uh, Louisville, Kentucky Seminary back there and was taking Greek back there and they, and they put prepositions on the board about the first week or two there and they said, look at this Greek preposition ace here like that. Of course they said ice and he said ace. <laughs> it's not ice. There's no ice and ace. Anyway, uh, he got up there and he said, what does this mean? He said, extension and limitation of thought or, ver ver thought or verbal action. They said, what? What? That's what it means grammatically. You have to dig deep to find that, but you've got it right on the surface now. Call. Call means all. It's kind of like pos in Greek, okay? All. Eretz. Eretz. Eretz means what? You remember what that one means? Young lady? See? Land. Land. Dry land. land. All right. You're real good. And then we have Kush. Kush. Kush is Ethiopia. All right, let's look at the word Kush on page 469 real quick. 469. 469 in Brown, Driver, and Briggs, Kush. Kush. Four sixty-eight. And 469. Kush. The uh, Greek is is ki, omicron, epsilon, sigma. Kush. X O U S is what it looks like in English. Okay, Kush. From whom descended the southernmost peoples known as Hebrews? Okay. The land of the people of the southern Nile Valley, or Upper Egypt, extending from Seen, it says, and definitely to the south, to Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a Greek word there. It's Alpha, Eota, Theta, Eota, Omicron, Pi, Eota, Alpha. Ethiopia. Just exactly like it is in English. Our word Ethiopia came from Greek. Ethiopes, the land, all right. Interminant of either land or people, including both. The Laos Ethiopion. Laos means people. You know when you read Greek and Hebrew, you can't study one language without the other. Half of this Hebrew lexicon here is in Greek and a little bit in English. <laughs> it's like the... Uh, Kyle and DeLeash, that great big ten volume uh, commentary on the Old Testament. It's in Latin, it's in German, it's in Greek, it's in Hebrew. If you don't know those languages, you're in a lot of trouble. You can put that ten volume set on your shelf, but you better learn the languages where you can read what it says. <laughs> but you'd be surprised what you can find when you get your, your sleeves rolled up. Cushy. All right, Cushite. Cushite. These are those Ethiopians, aren't they? Ethiopia. Ethiopia came from what language? Greek. Greek. Ethiopia. It's Cush in Hebrew. All right. <coughs> the Garden of Eden was probably near the Persian Gulf. Of what most people think. The Garden of Eden probably in the Persian Gulf. If you go into many cities, or many countries, I should say, we're having a lot of trouble with Syria. I was nine years in Damascus. I'm not nine years, nine months. Nine months. I will get it right in a minute. I was nine days in Damascus, Syria. Nine days. They have all kinds of ancient sites over there, and if as you go out from Damascus, 
toward the east, you will find a place out there they call the Garden of Eden, and they will swear that's the Garden of Eden, and one of those rivers runs into it. Just exactly, one of those rivers. Remember the uh, Ethiopian that came to uh, the great Hebrew prophet, and he told him to go dip in the, in the Jordan seven times, and he'd come out, he had leprosy. He said, I could have been dipping in that clean water over there in Damascus, over there by the Garden of Eden, what they say was the Garden of Eden. And you told me to go over there and dip in that muddy stream seven times? They said, go do it. See what happens. He went in there, and the seventh time he went down, he came up just like baby skin. Obedience. <clears throat> All right. Let's go on 214 now. We Shem, Hanahar, Hashilishi, Chidel, Chide Kel, Hugh, Haholek, Kidmoth, Ashur, We Hanahar, Harivi, Hugh, Feroth, Feroth. And name, look at that. We, we means what? And, and it's a what part of speech? Conjunction. Conjunction. Oh, conjunction. A conjunction. And Shem, name, monument, pillar, and name the fame of the river, the river. All right. Hanahar. Okay. The third. Ha Shilishishi. That's quite a deal. Ha she shilishi. The third, Chede Kel. The Tigris. The Tigris. All right. The Tigris. The Chedelke. Let's look at that one, 293. Let's look up that word here for a moment. 293. Mm -hmm. 293. All right. 293. Yeah, that's, you're reading your notes, aren't you? Okay. Chidel Kel, all right. 293. 293. It's a house or a chamber, a hidden place. It's like a safety box, like a safe, like a closet, okay? That's what the name uh, Tigris are Chedel Chedikel 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 Like a citadel Yes Citadel Yeah Chedadel mm -hmm. Concealing It means to dwell uh, A chamber A room A bridal chamber Alright Bridal chamber uh, inner chamber, chamber within a chamber, the innermost chamber within a chamber, a storeroom, a bathroom sometimes, a bathroom. The kings had one little place in their palace in their bedroom where they had a bathroom. This was the inner room, okay? Uh, that's about it. Let's go on a little further now. So we look at, look at this word here. That means inner chamber to conceal the tigress. And he the one walking eastward. Now what's walking? What's walking eastward? The river. The river is a he. He, the river, is walking eastward. And eastward means what? What does eastward mean? Kid, Kid Ma, what does eastward mean, uh, Brother Roger? You remember? Uh, the start of the world, or something like that. It means the front. The front. The front. East is the front. That's where the sun comes up. That's the front. That's what we call the front. That's where the sun comes up. So that's the front. Okay. Ashur, Assyria. Okay, Assyria. And the river, Wehanahar. The fourth, Ha Rivi, he, 
Ferroth. This is uh, sweet water, vitamin water, collodial water, okay? Mineral waters. That's the Euphrates. Euphrates. Euphrates goes, that river, Euphrates goes, how long is the Euphrates River? Any of you remember how long that river is? That's a long river, people. That's a long, long river. And goes all the way down and dumps in what? In the Persian Gulf. And if you look at the Persian Gulf, as it is from Arabia and everything down in here in the Persian Gulf, okay, and it dumps down in here, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and the Tigris and the Euphrates, now, what's the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates? What's it called? Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia which means the land between the rivers, Mesopotamia. And it dumps down into the Persian Gulf, and the Persian Gulf, one time, they said, was up here, much further. But in the last 6,000 or so years, it has filled in a lot. Because of what? All of the minerals. Now, we talked about uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, or Gennesaret. And we talked about the Dead Sea area, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has no outlet, does it? It just goes there. Now, the Sea of Galilee is how many feet below sea level? You can, you, can, uh, you can fly in the air below sea level all the way with an airplane. You can go below sea level all the way down the Jordan Rift. Uh, you start down by the Sea of Galilee, not Sea of Galilee, but the, uh, the Dead Sea, and fly below sea level all the way to the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is about 600 feet deep, if I remember. I'm just going off the top of my head with this. could be a little different. Now, that's quite a little bit below sea level, isn't it? And is the earth, is the earth's surface, is it constantly tight? In, in the, uh, you drilled all wells. And you drill through strata, and there are cracks in the strata, aren't they? Lots of cracks in the strata, and there's a lot of pressure down below the surface, and it pushes things up sometimes. Down at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee are, were many salt springs. How many of you knew that? There's fresh water going in and out from Mount Hermon all over the place, but there are salt water springs at the bottom because it's below sea level. And here's the sea out here and here's that. So guess what? Pushing up through the fractures in the earth. Once Israel got control of that area, they went down and they stopped up a lot of those salt springs and made the water a little more fresh water coming down the Jordan so they could irrigate with it. Before, they were irrigating land with salt water. If you go out there at the lake bottom, the old lake bottom out there but where I live on out toward Taft, back at the back way, it used to be all alkali flats. You know why? Because all of the water from the Kern River and all the Sierras came down the Kern River and uh, Caliani Creek and ran out into this area out there and flooded it. And it just keeps going on and to bring all those minerals down. If you've gone into Kern River Canyon, you'll see how the rocks are worn. All those minerals ended up out there. The Sea of Galilee is the heaviest water because of all of this. It's heavy water. And heavy water will carry rocks, all kinds of stuff. And so for Thousands of years from Galilee all the way down to the Dead Sea, all this water ran, and we had gobs of salt water there. And you can't go. You, did you ever go in the Sea of Galilee? I mean, in, in the I Salt Sea? You get it. You couldn't push. I tell you what. You'd have to have lead all over you to, to get down below that water. You can float on that water like you're sitting on a mattress. Something else. It's it's really weird. It's slimy, oily tasting, and and feeling water. It's Boy, it's rough. That the Dead sea. That's the Dead Sea. The no, the Sea of Galilee, the salt came from the Sea of Galilee and went right. down there. Okay, the, the Dead Sea, you can't, I mean, you can't submerge yourself in it. You can go out there and just float around on it. If somebody wants to learn how to swim, you can learn how to swim in the Dead Sea because you're not going to drown ever. All right. Well, we're really close to the time that we're supposed to be over there and baptizing this fellow right here. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll quit right there, all right? Uh, Christine, it's good to have you back here. Would you come up and dismiss us, please? Sure.
<clears throat> Dear Lord, I just thank you for this time, and I thank you for um, just Brother Jim opening the word and explaining to us, and I just thank you for this time that we have to be with fellow believers, and I thank you for the baptismal waters that will be stirred tonight, Lord, and I just praise your name, and we ask that we go out and we use what we've learned to glorify you. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We went from 2, 12 through 14. Are you coming back here? Afterwards? We'll be coming back.